behold, before our very eyes, a transformation. We've changed your key into a coin. What happened to the key? It's been returned to you. Look closely, sir. You'll find the key back in your pocket. May we see it, please? My name is Morgan Neville, and I'm director of They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, which is a film about Orson Welles making the film The Other Side of the Wind. It's a story of the last day of the director's life. The darling of Hollywood who fell out of favor. Wait a minute, that's Orson. I remember watching my first Welles films when I was probably 10. I grew up in a house full of film freaks, <laughs> which was a great place to grow up. My dad had what felt like the largest Betamax collection west of the Mississippi. And particularly, Wells was somebody who my dad revered and started exposing me to very early on. But the film that influenced me the most was a film I didn't see as a teenager. I didn't see until my 20s, which was F for Fate. Ladies and gentlemen, by way of introduction, this is a film about trickery and fraud, about I saw a screening of it. It would have been probably early 90s, and I was a journalist at the time. I was just leaving college, and I hadn't decided to make documentary film yet, even though I love documentary. And that film was one of the films that got me really excited about what you could do with nonfiction storytelling. Well, let's start again. It was so far ahead of its time. There are things that nobody's followed up on in terms of the potential of what you can do with the medium, you know, what he's doing with the essay film, with his sense of play. Somebody very, very uh, bumpers on somebody very pretentious. Pretentious. Wells had such a strong hand, and that's something you don't see a lot of, and that was something that really, really impressed me. Everything you'll hear from us is based on solid fact. Fake, in a way, is a giant deception. And it begins as a film about an art forger, Elmir Dahori. Elmir? Elmir? Who is Elmir? And then becomes a film about Clifford Irving, who is a biographer of Dahori. And Irving, it turns out, is himself a fake for having written a false biography of Howard Hughes. And Wells himself grew up a magician and War of the Worlds, he points to, as kind of one of his great hoaxes. They are Martians. So ultimately, it's a film about a hoaxer who's being written about by a hoaxer who's being documented by a hoaxer. Fake is a fake, and Elmir himself is a fake faker. Fake fakes. <laughs> The origin of Effort Fake started with filmmaker Francois Reichenbach, Hello. who himself had made a film about Orson Welles in 1968 and had been making a film about Dahori, this art forger, and came to Orson to ask him to narrate it. And the story I've heard was that Orson looked at the footage and said, I think I can do something more with this. Much of the film, from Orson's point of view, was found footage. He then ended up shooting his own narration bits. I guess it's more than narration. It's his own journey through the film, too. And so it's this collage of these different layers of story, of found footage, original footage, and his own voice. And it just creates this amazing tapestry of a story. I'd never been on the stage, but I told them in Dublin I was a famous star from New York and somehow got them to believe me. And that's how I started. Began at the top and have been working my way down ever since. At the end of his life, he was making money by doing commercials and appearing on TV, and he took that money and put it into his own movies. His movies never came out, so nobody got to see the work he was doing for those last 15 years of his life. And so in the public perception, he was seen as somebody who was kind of a has-been, and nobody realized that he was working every single day in the scrappiest, most guerrilla of filmmaker ways to do what he wanted to do. I think the scale of doing documentary and the scale of being able to create things in the Edit Bay gave Orson all of the control that he was lacking with so many other bigger productions. So he really took to it. You know, his daughter told me he never traveled anywhere without taking a steam deck with him. So whenever they traveled, he always had two hotel rooms, one for the edit machine and one for him to sleep in. 
and then roll back and come in again. F for Fake is a tour de force of editing. You know, it's it's a film that was completely created in editing. Everybody knows Elmia, but Elmia what? He has about 60 times the same name. De Hori? He's called his mate Hori, Uri, Bori, Suri. The editing is so tight. There's virtually no air in that for fake. Sorry, I've been jumping around like this because that's the way it was. Clifford Irving, take two. <laughs> Let's pull ourselves together if we can and begin at the beginning. No. The experience of watching F for Fake for the first time generally ends with you saying, okay, I need to watch it again right now. It's wonderfully fun because it makes us question how passively or actively we're watching something. For the past 17 minutes, I've been lying my head off. One thing I really appreciate about, about Wells is that he loved the narratorial voice. He came out of radio, of course, and he was one of the all-time great storytellers in that medium and in film. And I think he loved a strong storytelling voice. As a charlatan, of course, my job was to try to make it real. Not that reality has anything to do with it. And that narrator is not a voice of God, it's a character. That was something in Effort Fake that made a huge impression, that Wells was making a film about himself, but it's also not exactly himself, and it's a version of himself, uh, and that he's kind of pulling the viewer, snapping them from one point of view to another by the scruff in the neck. There's a famous quote, I think it's from Hitchcock, where he says, in scripted films, the director is God but in documentaries, God is the director. And that essentially means that as a documentarian, you can't control things, that it is chaos. And I feel like a big part of what we do as documentarians is try to impose some narrative order to the chaos of real life. Orson, in a way, was a scripted director who tried to insert chaos into the formality of scripted production. I mean, he said the job of the director is to preside over accidents. <laughs> and if things were moving too smoothly on a production, Orson would throw a hand grenade in the situation. And that, I think, was where Orson was at later in his career. He really came to appreciate the real unexpected things that come from chaos. And he didn't see it as something to be avoided. Now on this tablecloth, which is decorated with a map, is where everything <laughs> Which I've just lost up with some wine, but I understand wine brings good luck. Or in the ear, well, we can... He was a little luck anywhere. Effrafake is an absolutely meta film. Right, Francois. Wells, in that way, is such a postmodernist, re-evaluating the idea of what truth is. I find him incredibly inspiring as a filmmaker. I think he's a character to be rediscovered by every generation. When I see somebody like Orson, who in his 60s was acting like a film student in the best kind of way, saying, whatever it takes to get this vision out there, I will do. You know, so Orson would beg, borrow, and steal. He would forge filming permits. He was like a kid in that way. And to me, his lack of ego when it came to the art, I find incredibly inspirational. I offer my apologies and wish you all true and false. A very pleasant. Good evening.